Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 22nd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we believe establishing a House Ways and Means Committee is a good thing. Second, we explain why the COVID relief bill currently making its way through Congress both spends too much and at the same time shortchanges Alaska and other state and local governments in need. And third, following up on a listener request, we look at SB 75, Senator Von Imhoff's proposed spending cap bill. And now let's join Michael. Let's dive down into this weekly top three thing. The first and foremost is this creation of this brand new committee. Now, it has been seated before this committee, but it was a it was a short term committee. The Ways and Means Committee here in the state of Alaska with Ivy Sponholtz as its chair. There was a lot of speculation as to what it's going to cover, but the Fairbanks Daily News Miner now has got a piece out talking about it. Give us uh, give us your hot take on the new Ways and Means Committee. Well, the Ways and this Ways and Means Committee also is a is a uh, short duration committee. It's authorized until the end uh, of the current legislature, which is which is a two year term. It's not made into a, a standing committee. It's still a special committee. Um, and uh, and frankly, I've been uh, an advocate of having a Ways and Means Committee for the past few years. The the reason, well, for the past several years actually, the reason is. Uh, that as our fiscal situation has continued to deteriorate over the last century, over the last decade, <laughs> last century, over the last decade, it has it, it, it the, the the process that the legislature has gone through to try to address it uh, has not been very satisfying. Finance committees have held hearings on it, and then they've gone on to do other things, um, and really, there's there's not been a laser focus. Uh, anywhere in the legislature on trying to deal with uh, uh, with the fiscal situation. Now, uh, uh, Senator Stedman says the Senate Finance Committee this year is going to do that, uh, and they're not going to go home until they have done it. Um, we'll see if that happens. Uh, but at least to this point, there's not been a committee that's, fo- that's, that's been entirely focused on uh, trying to resolve the state's fiscal situation. Ways and means in the past uh, has been used by both Republicans and Democrats uh, as a way to set up a committee that would laser focus on uh, on issues, um, and um, and I thought it would be a good idea to 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 get to get uh, a Ways and Means Committee established again, regardless of of, of who's the chair or who, who's on the committee. Uh, this uh, legislature has done it in the House, um, and here is uh, what its scope is according to the resolution that established it. Uh, it is established to consider methods to control state spending, identify ways in which state government programs may be made more efficient, and propose new measures to raise additional state revenue. Um, two of those three are, are, are things that, that we should have been doing for a long time. Consider methods to control state spending, identify ways in which state government programs may be made more efficient. The third is one that uh, that has has grown out of uh, proposed new measures to raise additional state revenue has grown out of the failure uh, in the past to do uh, to do the first two, and I think it's I think it's a good I think it's a good setup 
uh, to bring a focus uh, uh, to the problem. I know that the Republicans voted against it uh, in the House, uh, and uh, Sarah Rasmussen, the independent Republican in the House, voted against it, frankly, because I think she thought it would infringe on her her uh, her power on the House Finance Committee. Um, but it, the, the Finance Committee has gone in and out of, over the years, has gone in and out of trying to address these issues. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, I think that I think Ways and Means is a good way to do it. Um, it needs to uh, it needs to focus on all three of those. Consider methods to constro- control state spending spending caps. Identify ways in which state governments may be programs may be made more efficient. I think that is I think that's a, a, an invitation to go in and look at the formula programs that just keep going and going and going, sort of regardless of. Uh, of what the actual costs are or what uh, what uh, uh, should be uh, allocated to those programs um, and I and I and I think it's a it's a it's a right way to do it what comes out of the ways and means committee isn't going to be law it's going to have to go through likely will have to go through the finance committee uh, and and certainly will have to go to the floor and be voted on on the floor so it's not a it's not a control committee in the sense that whatever it says is going to be is going to be law. It is. It is simply a way of getting the getting these issues marshaled uh, and uh, and progress forward. My, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say my fear in reading the this piece in the Fairbanks Daily News Miner about it. My main concern on this is that it seems like they're focusing not on the first two issues. Uh, hardly at all in the discussions with the members that they're talking about. It's like they're immediately going just to the new revenue uh, frontier uh, instead of uh, looking at the first two items as well. Well, Adam's got a, the 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 reason that article appeared in the in the news miner is because Adam Wool's on the committee, and Adam's got a bill that he certainly wants heard. Uh, it's the it's his uh, HB uh, thirty five, uh, the or thirty seven rather the the flat tax bill. Uh, and and he wants he wants a, a place to to be able to discuss it uh, and work on it, and uh, is on the committee along with uh, uh, along with uh, Andy Josephson out of Anchorage, Calvin Shragi out of Anchorage, Andy Story out of Juneau, Mike Prox out of Fairbanks, and David Eastman. Um, and and certainly I think Adam's bent is to try to focus on that. But the committee's charge is broader, um, and I think it's it's sort of up to, to Prox and, and, and Eastman to push uh, from the Republican side to push uh, the committee to uh, to focus on uh, uh, to focus on uh, spending caps and uh, uh, and on efficiencies to get this bill through both bodies. It's going to have to be to get any bill through both bodies that addresses the state's fiscal situation. It's going to have to be all encompassing. It can't just be a revenue bill as we as we discussed on the program last week and as we've discussed on prior programs. It needs to also address uh, controlling uh, state spending and it needs to address um, uh, how the PFD is going to be treated. Um, And and so it's it's if if the committee focuses just on that one thing, it's not doing uh, its job. It's not going to be getting putting together a bill that I think is 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 passable uh, in both bodies. It'll just be spinning its wheels, and it'll be another wasted effort. But but to have a committee focus like this, I mean, you can sort of view it. Maybe it helps some people to view it as a subcommittee of finance, a special focused subcommittee uh, on coming up with recommendations uh, with uh, with respect to spending cuts and spending caps and uh, and uh, 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 revenue measures. But it's but it is it is a way of getting the legislature organized, or at least the House organized, uh, to uh, to address these issues that are just not going away. I mean, we've got a billion dollar deficit. Even the governor admits we've got a billion dollar deficit uh, that goes forward to the to the end of the decade, and the legislature has has in various ways put off uh, dealing with that uh, over the last decade, relying on drawing down savings instead. We're at the end. We've drawn down all the savings. Uh, the only, the only uh, uh, pot of money left is to start drawing down, start taxing future generations by, by making overdraws on the on the ERA. It is time to address this issue. We haven't done it uh, through other, uh, through other means, through the traditional means of the finance committee. So I think it's I think it's a useful way of trying to, trying to bring a focus to uh, to the issue. 
uh, and trying to uh, 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 develop an approach, a comprehensive approach uh, that deals with all these problems. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the new House Ways and Means Committee here in the state. Uh, so, Brad, do we need to have a commensurate committee created in the Senate to make all this work, or can all this be done from the House side? I've never, I don't think I, I recall ever seeing a Ways and Means Committee on the Senate side. The House uh, uh, has generated uh, these proposals, these thoughts, these ideas, uh, and in the past when they've used ways and means, um, and then uh, uh, put that into legislation and then gone and then it's gone over to the Senate. It would be, um, and, and then Senate Finance handles it over there. Um, it would be, uh, it wouldn't be the world's worst idea to have one also in the Senate, but that's just not the way the Senate's operated in the past. And I think as long as the House is generating these ideas, is generating the concept, and, and again, it needs to be comprehensive. To pass both bodies, it's going to need to be comprehensive. Uh, uh, to uh, For the House to be generating these ideas, I think, is, a, uh, is, a, is, 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 is it, it's an improvement over where we've been, uh, uh, and it's a, and I think it's a, a useful way uh, to, to go forward, whether the Senate does it or not. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. All right, so House Ways and Means, it's, uh, you know, you say it was an, a needed body. Um, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it, whether they fulfill the whole mandate, uh, just the, uh, uh, you know, all three items on the resolution, or whether or not they focus strictly on the new revenue, which, again, is kind of my fear. As you said, the Republicans on the committee need to be, you know, need to be cognizant of the fact that they need to be pushing on the, the you know, more limited government appropriations and spending limits and making government more efficient. But we'll, I guess we'll watch it and we'll see where it goes from, uh, where it goes from here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's still in this formation. It's gotten, it's, it's had no uh, meetings, obviously. The House just got organized last week. Uh, it's had no bills referred to it, presumably, uh, since the Speaker was the one that, that, uh, led the resolution on forming it she will start uh, uh referring uh, uh bills to it i from the from the fairbanks news minor article it appears appears that adam will contemplates that his bill at least will be referred to it yeah uh and um and and i and presumably there will get some referrals but it's still it's still starting out but uh, again, I think it's a, a, a positive development in terms of bringing a laser focus on this issue. Um, let's move on to number two. The Biden stimulus plan um, is uh, is out for the coronavirus uh, stimulus. And uh, your question is, will it help Alaskans? Yeah, exactly right. Um, about $500 billion dollars. My mind always has to go for millions when dealing in Alaska to billions when dealing with the federal government. About $500 billion of the $1.9 trillion uh, 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 proposed uh, uh, aid package that's working its way through Congress right now is, is in one form or another state and local aid. Uh, it is uh, uh, a portion of it is direct aid to states, a portion of it is direct aid to localities, and a portion of it is direct aid to uh, K through 12. Uh, and and universities, but combined, that's about five hundred uh, uh, billion dollars. The, uh, the 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 problem with it is, but there's a serious problem with that. One, it's not allocated uh, anywhere close to uh, reflecting uh, the 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 way that the that the that the pandemic has has economically affected. Uh, uh, state and local government. Um, it is allocated based upon two two pieces. One is a minimum for uh, each state, and then the remainder of it is allocated on uh, the number of unemployed uh, in each state. And so you can you can readily uh, guess that a state like California or Texas or New York that has, in terms of numbers, many more unemployed than Alaska gets a much bigger share of that. The problem, though, is that that doesn't match up at all to, uh, to, the, to the adverse impact uh, on state revenues. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in more detail uh, in the second segment. But it, it's, it's, it's good news in the sense that the federal government is focused on 
the uh, problems facing uh, state and local governments uh, and and education in terms of the economic impact of the, of the pandemic. But it's bad news in terms of the way uh, that the funds are being allocated. And, and frankly, the, 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 the result of that is we're spending, the federal government's going to spend way the hell too much money, uh, but they're spending it in the wrong place. They aren't helping the states that are, that are most significantly impacted. We're in the middle of the weekly top three. We were just talking about number two, which is the bailout. Um, and one of Brad's uh, main concerns was that it was, uh, they were trying to just distribute it kind of equally instead of looking at the states that were the hardest hit uh, in, in impact from the COVID economies. Uh, and instead of just giving it to the largest, most populous states, they should be a little bit more, I think, surgical and laser focused is what Brad is saying. Um, you know, especially in states that have been hit very hard, you know, t- Hawaii is mentioned in this uh, Seattle Times article that talks about it because they've lost uh, something like 20 something percent of their economy overall. Um, their $18 billion a year in uh, tourism revenue has gone down to seven. Uh, so definitely a, a, a big time. Uh, Brad, uh, continue on here. Well, here, here's here's sort of the, the, the problem in the nut, in a nutshell. All of the analyses uh, uh, uniformly have shown that some states have been hit much, much harder than than other states. There's a uh, there's a chart uh, in uh, in the Seattle article or in the in the Washington Post article where it came from that that shows the the, the shortfalls, tax shortfalls, revenue shortfalls uh, in 2020 among the various states. Alaska leads the pack at the bottom. Alaska is is shown to be uh, uh, and these numbers come from the Urban Institute. They aren't uh, a fairly neutral source. They aren't. Uh, they aren't uh, uh, made up by somebody. Alaska shows to be down 43 percent. This is largely our oil tax revenues, down 43 percent in 2020 uh, compared to uh, uh, compared to 2019, compared to, to the pre-COVID pre-COVID period. Hawaii is down 17 percent. Oregon is down 13 percent, uh, and you can go through other states. Those states have been very hard hit. Other states, on the other hand, uh, have frankly been fine or grown uh, uh, through uh, through the uh, uh, through the pandemic. California, for example, is running a budget surplus uh, of somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five billion dollars uh, uh, year on year, uh, coming from uh, primarily from income taxes, as the economy has has gone into this K recovery, uh, visualizing the letter K uh, with the upper branch being uh, 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 upper income uh, folks, and the lower branch of the K, the lower leg of the K being lower income folks. As, as, as the economy has gone into this K recovery, California has actually profited, if you will, uh, from, uh, from the increased income uh, that has Occurred as a result of prior uh, uh, federal uh, uh, relief uh, packages uh, and uh, and and other things. So California is 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 26 billion dollars to the plus uh, in terms of uh, in terms of increased revenue as a result of uh, as a result of the uh, as a result of the pandemic. Yet under the formulas that are being used. Uh, in the um, in the relief package, currently being used in the relief package, it gets another another twenty six billion dollars uh, of relief uh, at the state level, another fifteen billion dollars of relief at the uh, at the local level, for a total of forty one billion dollars of, uh, of 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 state and local relief uh, coming out of the out of the packages currently constructed. Alaska, on the other hand, Alaska uniformly recognized as the hardest hit uh, adversely impacted state uh, of of all of the the 50 states uh, is it only gets out of the current allocation 800 million dollars to state government and 258 million dollars to local government for a total of one billion dollars I'm not arguing that Alaska should get should get forty billion dollars. I'm not saying that it should get the same as California, but what 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 the numbers do tell you, the numbers, if you look at the numbers of impact, do tell you that California doesn't need anything, and Alaska needs a lot more uh, than a billion dollars to fill in the holes that have occurred at the 
at the state and local level. So we, we've got we've got too big a package um, that is going to, as I said over the break, is going to increase inflationary pressure uh, on the economy. It will increase the burden of future generations by adding to the debt uh, uh, another 1.9 billion dollars. We got we got too big a package, uh, at, and and we have it misallocated in a way that we're not really helping. Uh, the states. And before before somebody makes the point, well, yeah, California is just Democrats helping Democrats. Texas uh, is getting um, uh, I just lost my oh, Texas is getting uh, forty three billion dollars uh, at uh, at the state and local level uh, uh, as a result of the bailout. And Texas is not suffering uh, uh, much at all. They're not they're not in surplus like California is. Uh, but they but they don't have the same sort of deficits uh, by any stretch of the imag- imagination that that Alaska and Hawaii have. Yet Texas is getting uh, 43 billion dollars uh, in bailout. Florida is getting 25 billion dollars. So it's not just it's not just the blue states that are uh, benefiting out of the way this, these allocations are working. It is the red states as well. It's the larger states. Um, and uh, and stay and 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 we're not doing it in a way that affects uh, that that affects uh, um, that, that 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 deals with the the problems being suffered by uh, the states that are being hard hit like uh, Alaska and Louisiana and elsewhere. Moody's just came out. Moody's the the rating agency just came out with an analysis uh, a couple of days ago, which which reinforces the point. It has. Uh, an analysis of the states that are uh, the, the states that were suffered the most in terms of fiscal shock uh, as a result of COVID. Alaska again uh, had the highest number uh, of states suffering fiscal shock, uh, and then the the amount of uh, took into account the amount of uh, federal aid that was given to calculate the the shortfall net of federal aid. Alaska, Louisiana, Nevada, Hawaii. Uh, are all, Oklahoma, which is another oil state, uh, all at the top of the list in terms of of the impact, adverse impact, even after taking into account uh, the federal aids that that, that has come uh, to point. Uh, California, Texas, other states uh, uh, in the in the plus, uh, not suffering suffering an adverse uh, fiscal shock. Uh, yet this package uh, is uh, is being allocated in a way that uh, that. Uh, uh, gives more to uh, gives even more to the states that that are doing okay have come out of this uh, okay uh, and less to the states that are that are being hurt. So it's 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 too big a package and it's misallocated in terms of how the funds are uh, being given out. Uh, and Alaska is going to come out of this uh, even after taking into account the the current aid package. Alaska is going to come out of this still way behind the curve. Uh, in terms of uh, the adverse impact from the from the pandemic, when when members of Congress are trying to say, right. well, this this will make everybody whole. We'll be fine after all this. The re- relief bill is loaded up like a Christmas tree with gifts to Biden's friends and supporters, says Charlie. I mean, overall, I mean that's a that's a deeper problem. I mean, there's a whole thing here, uh, Brad. The um, uh, Pennsylvania Wharton Business School just came out uh, with an analysis of the uh, 1.9 trillion dollar relief package, and uh, said that uh, you know, hey, it'll be great for about two years, and then it will uh, then start to slow the economy, decreasing. Uh, the GDP by 0.2 percent next in two years, and then uh, continuing all the way out to potentially 2040, <laughs> with the lingering effects of this, trying to get this done. I mean, the question is, should we be spending this amount of money in that regard anyway? I mean, I think is the deeper question there. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a huge been a huge um, uh, pushback on the 1.9 trillion uh, among the DC community, and it's not limited to just Republicans or or, or Penn Wharton or anybody else, Larry Summers, who was Secretary of Treasury in the Clinton administration and an advisor to the Obama administration, has said that uh, the 1.9 trillion is inflationary; that it's going to uh, that much money into the economy uh, is uh, uh, is going to uh, 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 lead to inflation over the over the course of the next. Uh, uh, Ten years. The Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, which I do a lot of work with, uh, has has looked at 
at the the size of the package relative to the what's called the output gap, which is the, dish, the, the difference between where GDP is under the pandemic and where GDP would have been projected to, to have been uh, without the pand pandemic if the uh, if the uh, uh, if, if if we hadn't suffered through uh, through the pandemic, the economic consequences of the of the pandemic, the output gap is normally what you look at in terms of what relief packages should be. You want to get the economy back to where it would have been uh, without uh, had had it not gone through the economic consequences of 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 the event. And the 1.9 trillion is something like four times uh, the output gap. Um, uh, <laughs> A lot of that, Jeez. a lot of that uh, uh, is being driven by the the promise of the additional fourteen hundred dollar checks to uh, uh, to uh, uh, citizens earning seventy five thousand uh, dollars or or less. Frankly, that's driven by that fourteen hundred dollar check is driven by Trump. It's driven by uh, uh, Trump's pushback uh, as the CARES Act was being fin finalized. That the checks that the checks in there were six hundred dollars. That he said the checks ought to be two thousand dollars. That rolled into a, a campaign issue during the Georgia uh, uh, runoff, Senate runoff elections, and and the Democrats sort of quickly picked up on that coming from Trump, and uh, and said two thousand dollars. We ought to you know have two thousand dollars in total checks. We ought to have a fourteen hundred dollar additional check. That's that's rolled into that's that's a big part. Of uh, of what's in the 1.9 trillion, so it's it, it is too big. It's way too big. It's not just the Republicans that are saying it's way too big. It's not just the economic analysis that are saying it's way too big. Uh, good solid Democrat uh, economists are are saying the same thing, uh, but it but it keeps on rolling, uh, and and it keeps on rolling because uh, there's uh, there's this broad based support uh, uh, for the for the the 1,400 dollar checks. Can I, I want to make a comment here, and I, I'm going to do it real quick so you can comment back on it. There was a part in this Seattle Times article that talks about the stimulus in general, and it said uh, there was a couple of things in here that just caught my attention. State and local governments are large employers, accounting for 13% of non-farm jobs in February. Public sector jobs also historically take longer to rebound from recessions than private ones. During the Great Recession, local governments tightened their belts in ways that took much longer to, un to undo, even after... Uh, the private sector had fully bounced back. And I'm thinking, yeah, but that's not an argument to s not make cuts in government. I mean, that seems to be the problem. The government is always the last thing that gets cut. we got about less than a minute here, Brad, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, the problem is we don't take these opportunities to look at, at efficiency in government, right? The the goal is is to bounce back to the government jobs that we had before without really looking at whether we need uh, that those level of government jobs. So uh, it, it, we should take these opportunities to try to analyze whether government's doing what it, what, it, what it should do and whether we could do it with less people, but we don't. Right, exactly. I agree with that. All right, well, let's move on to number three. Uh, real quickly here, we got about two and a half, three minutes. Uh, Natasha's bill, SB 75, it's an appropriations, a spending limit bill. Your thoughts and take on this. Yeah, uh, a listener asked last week about SB 75, if we'd looked at SB 75. We hadn't, so I dug into it uh, this week to be able to address it in today's show. It is a spending cap, but it's a spending cap that's based upon prior spending. It starts at $6 billion and then ratchets up based upon a, a formula that, that accounts for both inflation and uh, population growth, and it has exclusions uh, so, for example, uh, amounts uh, uh, to pay debt obligations of the state uh, are excluded from that $6 billion, added on top of the $6 billion, essentially, um, and, and it excludes money that goes to a state savings account or a fund that requires subsequent appropriation, which is like the oil tax fund, uh, the, 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 the oil credit fund. Um, so it's really $6 billion plus uh, those exclusions escalated. It is. It is. It, it's a fig leaf. It is a way of saying yes. I'm in. I'm in favor of a spending cap, but I don't want a spending cap that actually controls spending. <laughs> I, right. I want something that I can say, uh, yes, I supported. Yes, I pr proposed. And yes, I. I voted for a spending cap, uh, but the spending cap won't ever come into play 
uh, because revenues don't support it, the spending cap, the spending cap will just be out there, and it'll sort of like the the current constitutional spending cap, just sort of sp uh, uh, spiral off into the future without without ever limiting uh, limiting spending. So right. Well, I mean, again, got, we're at a budget that's four and a half billion dollars with a two billion dollar deficit, and she proposes a six billion dollar spending cap. That seems a little ridiculous. It 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 is. It's just a it's just a fig leaf. Yeah. I mean, Brad, this is exactly the same thing that we have right now. I mean, the constitutional spending cap is where, I mean, it's right now, it's way beyond where we were at. And this is the problem with almost every spending cap that we've seen proposed so far, is that they're all based on not, not on revenues, on historically what we've been receiving, but instead they're all based on what we've been spending, appropriations and everything else. I mean, they're meaningless at this point. They are. And even, Michael, even if you had a spending cap... That I mean, Natasha, if I recall correctly, she had this bill in the last session, and at one point she she proposed to start it at five billion as opposed to six billion. That was her uh, that was her effort at uh, at uh, finding some compromise. Uh, even if you brought it down to four point five billion, that doesn't uh, uh, solve the problem as long as you're going to tie it to that four point five billion spending and then escalate it uh, from there based upon inflation and uh, and, and population growth because our oil revenues uh, aren't aren't going up at the at the rate of inflation and 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 even if the the draws from the permanent fund uh, uh, would go up at the rate of inflation because oil because oil revenues are still a significant share of our revenues and they aren't going up the rate of inflation our revenues are actually dropping uh, at an inflation adjusted at an inflation adjusted rate so those who think a spending cap is actually going to be the solution here if we just if we just get it right it it is it's not just a spending cap it has to be the right part the right form of spending cap and 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 this isn't just a problem i mean the fact that you're you're tying it to past spending and inflating it from there this isn't a problem just with with sb75 just with natasha's approach the same problem is in, is in the governor's proposed constitutional amendment it also is a spending based uh, spending cap. Um, so it's um, it, 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 in a slightly different form, but nevertheless ties to spending as opposed to revenues. So it's uh, it, it, the, the fact that, you know, people come out and say, I'm in favor of a spending cap. Okay. I mean, that's good. Nice. Fa fantastic. But it's, it, it really depends on what kind of spending cap uh, you're proposing, whether it's uh, whether it's going to do any good or not. Well, and that's, again, been part of the problem the whole time. Every time they, they issue a spending cap, it always seems either it's statutory, which can be ignored uh, on the political whims or even the constitutional ones. Again, it, I mean, I just looking back at, uh, you know, trying to create a budget or a hard spending limit in your household and, you know, you make a you only make fifty thousand dollars, but you're going to put your spending limit at one hundred thousand uh, or eighty thousand, and just we'll figure out how to make up the difference. We're going to spend that much no matter what. It just it again it it flies right in the face of reason that this really means anything. This is really political theater. It is. It is. And, and, and to be fair, the governor's proposed uh, constitutional amendment is political theater as well for the for the for for the same reason. You. I, there, there has I, I, I crafted last last session last legislature. Uh, I crafted a, a revenue-based uh, spending cap, wrote out the statutory language and uh, and everything, and uh, and gave it to Senator Shower, who uh, uh, had 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 bills before him to do it at that at that point in time. And it just, I mean, the reaction was, oh, we can't do that. We can't do we can't do a revenue-based cap. It's got to be you know something else. So you come up with a spending-based cap, and you just you, you've got nothing. I mean. So I, I, I've not seen anybody introduce a revenue-based cap. Uh, uh, if somebody does that, uh, it'll be time to pay attention again. But these spending-based caps are just, uh, frankly, as you say, they're political theater and, uh, and, and a waste of time. They just really don't practically address the problem. What are you going to be watching this week, Brad, as we uh, we got about two minutes here? What are we going to be watching here this week uh, and paying close attention to as, as the rest of the week fills out? Oh, there's a couple of things uh, on my radar, Michael. One is oil search, uh, which has the PICA problem, uh, comes out with uh, uh, a periodic, I think it's their quarterly earnings report uh, and their statement of where they are. Uh, I'll be watching to see whether uh, they, uh, uh, w what kind of uh, statements they make about the PICA project 
and whether they uh, they're uh, continuing to move forward with it. Uh, they they have they've talked about reaching final investment decision by the end of this year. Uh, that's going to be a stretch, but I'll, I'll be looking at that. Uh, Senator uh, Stedman continues to hold a series of hearings in Senate Finance that I think are important uh, about uh, getting at the numbers of uh, of what's important uh, uh, from a state financial standpoint. Uh, those have been a wealth of inform those Senate Finance Committee hearings have been a wealth of information. And then uh, Ways and Means. Uh, will Ways and Means get referrals uh, uh, this coming week of, of bills? And uh, and will they kick off uh, their efforts? And when they kick off their efforts, will they kick it off uh, focused on spending as well as on uh, as on the revenue side? So th those are probably the three things early, early on that are on my radar for the week. All right. Well, <clears throat> Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you for coming on board. As always, it uh, is an interesting conversation, and uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, kind of analysis, uh, what, how your analysis plays out in the in the real light of day here over the next uh, week or so. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.